Moshi Moshi. Hello. I'm Zeb Ramspotham. And I'm Annie Ramspotham. And we're the Rambling Ramspothams. Our journey might be rambling, but we hope this podcast isn't. And so we just had to... We're recording actually on a Sunday, and this will be released on... Probably maybe a like Thursday. A, yeah, Thursday or Wednesday, just because the way the podcast like hosting website works, we have an allotment of time per month, and we don't want to go over our allotment, or else we have to pay more. But... <laughs> Well, it's Sunday. Revealing how cheap we are. Yeah, I mean, it's a hobby. <laughs> we're not, <laughs> we're not like rock stars or anything over here. Um, but we just had to do some moving around of our doors. I just thought this was interesting. Some mundane life for the <laughs> listeners about the guy out there weed eating. It's just so loud. Oh. Yeah, it was bothering Zeb. We had to shut some doors. Yeah, but I think it's interesting. So if if you're in America and you do some home lawn maintenance and you're thinking about a weed eater, in Japan they don't do what you're thinking about. Um, I used it sometimes at work. There is a disc attachment for weed eaters. It's like a little saw blade, and you put it on the weed eater, and then you have like a little metal blade. And in America we would use it for like a like especially stiff kind of like shrubbery Mm -hmm. so if it was almost like a little woody material and it was too thick for the like regular weed yeah like the regular like string trimmer to go through um so you're saying people here just like always use the metal blade always use the metal blade yeah i've never never thought about that it is much louder yeah i've never seen them use like the string attachment which i guess partly is nice because of course that degrades so you end up well, with like little microplastics all throughout your I yard confess i've never used a weed eater so really? yeah i never noticed this i guess i only noticed it because i used one a lot for work back home but yeah i just can't imagine doing everything with the little saw attachment because the string trimmer it is a wider radius and it's much better for grass but here in Japan, everywhere, I've only ever seen them use the saw attachment. It's so funny because it makes this high pitch like whining noise because it's like a little saw blade. Oh. So it's just, yeah, well, different. They also don't been... use lawnmowers here. Yeah, weed eaters are much more popular, even if it's like a wide expanse of grass. I mean, this is a generalization about our town in this one prefecture, but yeah. it seems to be pretty unpopular to use a lawnmower. Yeah, we've talked about it before that they'll like dispatch an army of guys with little yeah. like and they also don't use the attachments like so the weed eater i used at home had like a harness so you mm-hmm. could hook the weed eater to it so you didn't have to hold it the whole time the guys here those They're poor guys strong i guess yeah but well, they'll like this has de- been weed eater reviews with yeah Zeb. sorry i was just <laughs> it's just fresh on my mind because you know just hearing that poor guy out there on a sunday it's a weekend well, what's he doing working more well, than what we're doing you know what also is happening this weekend um the last bike race yeah which obviously i'm not there (laughs) since i'm here recording this so you might Um, remember we talked about zeb being uh competing in the jbcf what is that the japan bicycle club federation mm -hmm. races with the i think it's like the japan bicyclist club federation well the 2023 season ends this weekend yeah this was um i'm pretty sure I was keeping up with the calendar there for a while, and I'm pretty sure this weekend was the last, like, scheduled event, Um, at least in the Japan Pro Tour, so. There's no, like, mandatory number of races to go to, because Zepp's not there right now, Um, but you were competing, like, up until kind of, like, the heat of the summer, and then. Really up until June, and then. We went to America, and that kind of messed up some, they took a break, and then we went to America, and then when you came back. There was another race, but it was, like, right after we landed, so you were going to be too jet-lagged. Well, not too jet-lagged, so essentially the way my season went, I could, I think the last race I did was in June, and then in July they kind of, like, took a break because it's so hot. And then also in August, I don't think there was any race in August. Um, there might have been one, but we were in America and came back in September, and it was, like... That was a convenient break for me. Um, I like to take two to three weeks off and like not ride at all at some point in the year. And so I was like, being in America, I didn't want to have to travel with a bike. And we were there to see friends and family. So I didn't take a bike with me. 
so that was kind of like my off season and you kind of lose i feel like a lot of like top end like you know you're like sprinting and like harder efforts my endurance would have been fine but yeah it was like like race fitness wouldn't have been great yeah it wouldn't have been ideal especially because i hadn't been doing like efforts for so long so i just decided not to attend that weekend and then the next weekend i had to work because that was the um the debate contest well i know we've talked before about how you don't how you prefer the racing style in america Mm -hmm. and like the race setup so you probably won't do the jbcf races next year but would you do like one day events maybe hill climbs and stuff yeah i'd probably do a hill climb again just because that it was like surprisingly pretty fun and i really like climbing the issue in japan with hill climbs is i can't be very competitive why well it's just shocking how like i don't know if it's i don't know what it is i don't want to be like a japanese doctor that's like the asian body is different than you know like how sometimes people do that um but the guys i ride with are just so thin oh like Like, they're just generally smaller and lighter people yeah so if you think about like i'm like the heaviest guy that yeah. rides in that group. And Zeb's like 5'8 and like... No, I'm 5'9. Thank okay, you very much. 5'9 and like... <laughs> Which is like 175 centimeters, I think, for the... And what, like 150 pounds? Like on a on a good day, I'm like 146, which is very around specific. 66 kilograms. So not... What I'm trying to say is like not big and you're the biggest guy. <laughs> yeah, like in Japan, like... I mean, so in the JBCF, there are some guys who are actually, like, sprinters who are pretty, like, muscular and big. Um, but they're on, like, pro teams, so they're riding way more than me. Mm-hmm. Um, but then at, like, a hill climb, the people I'm competing against, I don't know, it's just different. Like, in America, I'm a very, like, maybe not very, but in America, I'm a lightweight person. Like, I'm not a heavy individual. Well, and we have cycling friends that are also thin, but they're taller, so they weigh more or but even like here in sprinter Japan, builds there's one guy that rides with us he's taller than me and he's six kilograms five or six kilograms lighter wow. than me so like 10 to well so even if you don't lighter. want to like focus on climbing i think it would be fun to look up uh someone was telling me about the haruna hill climb which happens in may oh. in gunma prefecture and then there's also akagi was the one of the volcanoes that i was able to ride on oh, yeah. in gunma and they have a Grand Fondo kind hmm. of style thing there. And also, I think it's called the Akaichi, like Akagi and Ichi together one hmm. time oh, okay. up Akagi. It's a hill climb. So stuff like that, I, I would be interested in doing Yeah. like after this. it's I, I'm so not ready for winter, yeah. but I know we're like going into winter. It's like almost here. Yeah. We so. went from like the peak summer heat to the end of fall kind of. It's not, it's not the end of quickly. fall at all. It's no, like but fall's just beginning. Yeah, it's just this the temperatures. This is the first time that we've been recording in like jeans and long sleeve. Do you remember when... No, I think last week I recorded in sweatpants and a hoodie. That's why oh. I put jeans on because I was wearing the same exact outfit. <laughs> so you're not looking <laughs> so, so sloppy. Yeah. No, I would it, definitely do more one day events. I guess for me, like I do like the competitive nature of cycling. And so that's one of the exciting draws for me. So if I want to do an event i have fun competing so i would want it i wouldn't want to do the events that are like the cookie cutter rides where they tell you not to compete i don't want to do that no but for like a hill climb where i don't have to be part of it but then it's hard because i'm like not competitive for it i i I guess mentally for myself maybe like um i would take it maybe too seriously Uh and then knowing like my competitors or i I did really enjoy Antake because that's kind of my, it was long. That was a hill climb that you did, what is that, in Gunma Prefecture? No, in uh, Nagano. Oh, yeah. Next to Matsumoto. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm better at longer efforts that aren't quite as steep. A lot of, like, especially hill climbs, so I was talking about this at the dinner with those guys. Um, They want me to ride on their team next year. Which could be fun because it's like local and this it's probably... This is the be, Yakiniku restaurant dinner yeah, from last week. Yeah. It'd probably be less commitment. But... So I would think about doing that. Um, but we were talking about it that so many climbs, especially in this area, are like 
seven percent grade Mm -hmm. which for me like a five percent grade climb that's fairly long Mm -hmm. is really ideal but a lot we have hill climb races here in ishikawa the akagi climb then maybe it was 53 switchback turns and i know that because they were like numbered this Mm -hmm. is actually a fun fact because i think it's fun (laughs) there are these signs that are on turns not every climb has them i don't know like how you decide but big long climbs will have each turn numbered with a sign and then there will be like r equals and a number underneath and i couldn't figure out what that was and it's actually the radius of the corner and so for drivers i, yeah, guess, I was gonna say but that's for like truckers yeah it'll say like on there drivers of course like a bigger number is a wider radius so it's a more gentle curve and mm. then a smaller number is a tighter curve yeah but i don't know it just was entertaining me like every single one of the 53 curves was numbered and had the radius how as are we were they climbing. defining curve it was like every single one was like a true switchback. Every was... single one was just even a curve because oh, okay. there was like a really wide one that was oh, like. Because okay. in Europe, they also like on popular climbs, like at the Grand Tours, they number, but typically only the switchbacks. Mm. So in Europe, usually you're only considering like the steepest switchbacks. Because I was going to say like one of the most popular climbs in the world is Alpe d'Huez, and I think it only has 21 switchbacks. That's probably also. So I was going to say steeper. like. A this, hill that has 53, like that seems, like in my curves. head, that would be like so extreme. I think but, you're also thinking it is like 90 degree switchbacks every time. And well, it, yeah, because it's a switchback. You number. No, I know what you mean, but it I was. I just think it's funny to number like a gentle, like. Well, I don't know. That's a little elitist about I mean, maybe, the yeah. climbs, but. Sorry. It was just a little gentle climb up to the top Mm. of this volcano and then at the top it was also cool because the top of the volcano had filled it hasn't erupted in a very long time and so the the crater that happened after the last eruption has filled with water and it's called a caldera like a cauldron i didn't know about this Uh, because we don't have volcanoes in north carolina geography class no so you knew but (laughs) the it was really cool because the caldera at the top of uh, I can't remember the volcano's name right now, but it when we got up there, it was a whole different climate almost because we were at the top of a peak and the mm-hmm. wind was blowing so much that the lake was actually had these white caps hmm. on the water. It was so rough out there. That's cool. Yeah, it was. I was impressed. I thought it was just going to be like a little pond up at the top, but it was a pretty substantial body of water. Yeah. I would also probably, some of those too, it, like the pay comes into the equation for me. Mm. Like, oh, well, if I'm going to pay X amount to go to an event, but Mm -hmm. then I could have just done, you know, a long training ride on my own for free. Because then we pay Um, for gas to get there and toll roads. Yeah, and so it's kind of like the competitive nature of the event and the enjoyment of that has Mm -hmm. to outweigh my own just enjoyment in cycling. And often I feel like in Japan, the events because in america i was never someone that wanted to go to like grand fondos and just go to like no there's nothing wrong but like you know charity rides where they just you pay and you go and maybe you get a t-shirt and it's just a fun social ride i never really liked paying for that kind of stuff just because at that point i could just go on a ride with my friends yeah and i wasn't really trying to go meet anyone new and like socialize if it's a charity ride it's different because you're essentially making a donation but if it's just a cookie ride where it doesn't the money doesn't go to anything yeah but i feel like most of the events in japan that are not within like the racing yeah they're they're mostly not charity rides they're just kind of like you pay for just a group ride yeah it's kind of like yeah you're paying to join a group ride yeah which is kind of i mean there's like a place and time for that but i'm not the kind of person I'm I guess. I'm not trying that, to make friends. <laughs> yeah, I'm out there to ride. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's just like my personal enjoyment in cycling yeah. is different. Yeah, I mean, that, we both so. do like the solo aspects of riding. Yeah, Even, and like you and I, we could go somewhere on a weekend and mm-hmm. just do a mega ride together. Mega. Or we could go. You well, know, even pay the a two of us and, like, will we'll spend weekends sometimes where we don't ride together. We'll just go do solo rides because yeah, we like that. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah well that's kind of the like long-winded conclusion of 
Yeah, I guess my race season's basically over. Huh? Like, it's all washed up. Yeah, I don't know what I'll do next. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm not sure going to stop some... riding. <laughs> but no, I'm sure you'll I'm find some quit. races. <laughs> I'm just done now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I'll just hang out. Yeah, I might go do some hill climbs or yeah, something like that. Well, but... switching gears from sports to art. Wow. We, yeah, we're covering all different kinds of all the bases here. But we went and enjoyed some art this past week. Um, so I don't know if listeners have heard about Team Labs. It's a, um, so to quote from their website, they were founded in 2001 and it's an international art collective. Um, it says that their collaborative practice seeks to navigate the confluence of art, science, technology, and the natural world, which is a lot of things. Um, and they're an interdisciplinary group of specialists that not only include artists, but also programmers and engineers and CG animators, mathematicians, and architects. And they have to have all those different backgrounds because most, if not all of their art is immersive and like interactive. Um, and they said that they aim to explore the relationship between the self and the world and new forms of perception. So yeah. the first time we got to experience one of their art exhibits was in Tokyo Mm-hmm. at the Team Labs Planets exhibit, which I think was in Ginza. Like, what was that area? It's out, like, towards the bay. By the harbor. Yeah, it's pretty far outside of Tokyo. But it's called Team Labs Planets, and that one is, it's not a permanent exhibit, but it's up until 2027, so... I feel like they keep extending it. Yeah. Because it's so popular. Because I feel like even, we talked about it on the podcast, but even when we when we went, I feel like it was already, they were like, this is the last year, mm-hmm. and then now it's been extended for, like, three more years. Yeah. Um, and they've custom built, I don't know if they built the building or they just took everything out of the building and built the exhibit inside it. It was probably, like, a warehouse. And probably. And they just built Cause that area an exhibit inside. It's pretty industrial mm-hmm. um, in yeah, the like harbor area. Yeah, like, when you're going area. out there, you're like... And I, I know that I mentioned it before. Um, I thought it was going to be more of, like, I don't know, like an art exhibit type mm, like museum. Like a museum. But the way that it's set up, it was way more fun. Yeah. Like, I really enjoyed it. I'm not really a museum person. Well, that's person. good. Because it was my idea, and I was like, let's go. It'll be great. And Zeb was like, okay. Well, yeah, because I thought it was... I didn't have any expectations. I thought yeah. it was going to be, like, a museum. So I was, like, okay with going just to see what it was like. But yeah. it exceeded my expectations. It was really cool. Well, so we got excited because Team Labs, they have exhibits all over the world, not just Japan. Which I also didn't know. I thought they were just a Japan thing. I did too. I've only ever heard about them in Japan, so yeah. maybe we're missing out. Um, but they brought something to Kanazawa Castle, so right in our backyard, kind of. Yeah. And this one's different because instead of building, instead of creating something to put art in, they put art kind of around and on an existing structure. So they said that the exhibition is part of their digitized city art project, where Team Lab explores how non-material digital technology can turn a city and its buildings into art without physically altering it. Hmm. So it took place at the castle. And it was was kind of a mix of light projection and immersive, like, things that they had brought in that you could walk through, um, mostly light projection. Yeah, and I had just seen a, um, I forget, oh, so I was with my brother and sister-in-law. Is that how that works? Yeah. And, um, <laughs> let's try to... Forget the yeah. title. Uh, so I was with them and we were at Oyama and I happened to see a sign and I was like, oh, like Team Labs Kanazawa, like that's cool. Like a poster advertising it? Yeah, they had like yeah. a little sandwich board thing set up, so... Yeah, I was like, I definitely want to see that because I remember seeing the one in Tokyo. So I was excited to. Yeah. And if you're listening and you're visiting Kanazawa, you live nearby, it's up until November 26th, I think, until the end of November. However, it's like another month. Yeah. However, the weekends are all already sold out. Um, So we went on a weekday. Uh, We went on Wednesday. It was crowded, but not like uncomfortably crowded. There were more people there on a weekday than I expected, but it wasn't. You know, I felt like I had a lot of space to walk around still. It wasn't too mm. many people. Yeah. So when you first... It takes place at night because of all the projection, but because the sun is setting so early, it was dark at 6 p.m., so we showed up right when it opened. Um, 
and when you walk into the castle area there's this really cool floral it was like animals made out of flowers that were as tall as the city as tall as the castle walls like running all over the castle walls and transforming and stuff um and then we kept walking and on one of the outer walls they had this black circle being projected and it was a uh, inso which is the i don't know if inso is a noun or a verb but it's the zen practice of where you draw a circle with a single brush stroke and they were they were portraying what they called spatial calligraphy so they were taking like two dimensional calligraphy and bringing it to look 3D with light projection so as that like calligraphy stroke rotated in air the projection sometimes it would look like a circle and sometimes it would look like a line um yeah there was, was a lot of interesting. new stuff it was like very interesting and it was nice because yeah, I didn't know any of this going into it. Yeah. So it was kind of like when we showed up, I was like, oh. Yeah. And it just kind of kept getting better and better, I felt like, as we went. Did so. you have a favorite part? Yeah. Um. I don't know. I like the, I liked the giant, like, light orb egg things. Yeah, that was my favorite. I don't know if that was, like, I really enjoyed that, but I also really liked the you could the coloring and then you could scan your picture in and then yeah. like came to life just yeah. because that was such like a fun i don't know like a neat thing so we went with two of our friends and the egg thing that Zeb's talking about is they <laughs> on their website they call them ovids <laughs> which i've never used that word before but they're basically just light up eggs and you're supposed to be able to tap them and the color changes the light color that didn't really work but it was fun like the four of us running through these huge eggs where you couldn't really like see over them and they were all in the outdoor park foresty area so it mm -hmm. felt very like uh, fantastical and stuff where you just stumbled yeah. across this and i think that's light what egg scene <laughs> yeah i think that's what team lab says a good job at that they create these like fantastical like settings mm -hmm. that make you feel like you're somewhere that's like a little bit magical. Mm. It doesn't, because you know sometimes when you're standing in a museum, you just feel like you're standing in a building. Yeah, it's like, hard to be like at art. immersed. But yeah, they do a very good job of making you feel like you're, I don't, know, I guess somewhere special or somewhere. The drawings that Zeb was talking about. So this was at the very end. They had four different characters you could choose from, and they were all local, like, generals and princesses, like Maya de Tauchier, and you could pick one and color them in. And so we just picked our little people, and and then when you bring them to this scanner, they scan what you've colored, and it becomes an avatar on this big projection, and your avatar can interact with all the other people. And it's it looks exactly like what you've drawn <laughs> and that yeah, was really cool it was really cool too because it was a 3d recreation mm -hmm. so i don't know i mean whatever program they use to scan it in does a really good job of like filling in obviously what's not included in the scan like the back of the character mm -hmm. and so yeah it created this 3d portrayal and yeah it was just really neat mm -hmm. and then your character like runs around with all the other characters and you can interact with them. So. Yeah. And it was, yeah, it was like a really fun... It's very creative. ...experience to see your little, like, coloring come to life. Yeah. It was fun. So this weekend is Halloween, and you've already kind of gotten a head start because when you came back from America, your omayage was Halloween candy, and you brought it to your coworkers. And what did they think? Did they like? I think overall they liked it. Um, so... I was going to say, and we, we snuck this into the middle of the episode, <laughs> so if you're listening, <laughs> I'm going to, you can email us, or I'll change the Q&A on Spotify. I think I can change the question to ask, like, what candy are they talking about? Mm -hmm. um, so I brought this bucket of Halloween candy, and what I had done was buy the big bags of a variety of Halloween candies, and then I just dumped them in there. Um, so I think in total there were eight candies, and that included Reese's Cups, Black Forest Gummy Bears, Whoppers, Kit Kats, Chewy Sweet Tarts, Chewy Nerds, Heath, and Laffy Taffy. And so out of those eight candies, which one do you think the teachers did not go for? 
when I picked up the bucket, there was noticeably one type of candy that was left behind <laughs> in the bucket. What's the least favorite American candy? Yeah, there was one that they were really not into. <laughs> and so <laughs> they they didn't eat that candy. We can but. share the answer next week. Yeah. But yeah, email us at ramblingroomsbothams at gmail.com. Or you can do the Spotify Q&A. Yeah. In other news, unrelated, <laughs> but we often think about our cats and cats in general, I guess. And you you found something out about an herb from Japan that cats might like. Yeah. Had you ever heard of silver vine? No. I hadn't either. Silver vine is like, I guess it's an Asian version of catnip, but it's even more, it has even more of the chemical that cats enjoy. In I it. looked it up because you were telling me about it and it's part of the kiwi family. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Hmm. But it's a, like the, the leaf or whatever is, you can use it like catnip. Yeah. So I didn't know that, you know, in America we let our cats maybe have catnip or that we put catnip in toys. And so that's what our cats enjoy. And in Japan and a lot of Asian countries, they're all about the silver vine, yeah. um, which is a more potent, like, thing <laughs> Even for your little cat friends. Catnippy. Um, so yeah. I was reading a news article, and there's some good news that researchers found that it's not addictive or toxic. Well, so that's good. People had a lot of concerns that their cats were becoming addicted to silver vine, or maybe it was like bad <laughs> for them. Mm. So they did a bunch of like blood tests and stuff on cats that have been using it for at least three years. Wow. And they found that, little addict cats. Yeah. And they found that there's like, they don't think there's any addiction or toxic nature. It's good. And they even think that cats roll in it as a repellent for mosquitoes. Hmm. That silver that vine has some like. for people. Yeah, like if I just rub silver vine all over me, I guess that's kind have of a, an outbreak or probably. something. <laughs> have some kind of allergic a reaction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why is she so rashy? Yeah. Um, but I thought it was really interesting because I also didn't know it's been around for like a really obviously plants have been around a long time. <laughs> um, but silver vine specifically for cats. So even dating back to the Edo period, there are ukiyo-e like woodblock paintings uh, that depict cats with silver vine hmm. like rolling around in it. And the Edo period's like 1600s to mid 1800s, so that's yeah. a pretty long time ago that they were already. I mean, that's, I wonder how long ago people domesticated cats, but certainly longer than that. Well, you know, they say that cats domesticated themselves. Oh, they're so clever. Yeah, there's studies that show that, like, cats weren't domesticated by people. Like, the cats made a <laughs> decision. But they just made an effort because then they could be fed by people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really funny. Because, you know, Egyptians had cats, right? Yeah. So, yeah, those well, guys are clever. And... In um, the cat's reaction, like when they roll around on the ground and stuff with catnip and with silver vine, sometimes that's called the matatabi dance in Japanese. And matatabi. Is that where they like wriggle around? Yeah, matatabi literally means travel again. And it's like when they're wiggling around on the floor. I don't know why it's travel again, but it's the matatabi dance. Hmm. So that's some good news for cats. Yeah. There's some good news for us. Oh. <laughs> Not so much good news for all. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. Why, the, why not? Because he's considering tax cuts uh. because he's so wildly unpopular Oops. and his approval rating is so incredibly low that he's considering using tax cuts to try and get the, the public to mm. approve of him again. Mm. Um, yeah, his political party is not doing great. Yeah, so I learned about this through a coworker because she just randomly said like something about tax cuts. And I was like, what? And she was like political, and I was like, "What? <laughs> what are you talking about?" <laughs> and she said something about how like maybe we're getting tax cuts. So I looked into it, and they're they're considering it. Mm. So, so nothing's happened yet, but no. it could be interesting to see what happens for yeah. fellow jets listening. Or yeah, because it would be nice if working. Our because with the um, with like inflation happening, which is finally. It's been happening like in the grocery store, but it's definitely more apparent now because mm -hmm. even transportation costs have been going up around us. Like our local train went up, our local bus went up. Mm -hmm. Just things my like that. My postage went up. Oh yeah, I, I forgot have about a your stamps. postcard club through my blue bike art stuff, and it it was four dollars to like for me to send you a postcard with some stickers in it once a month, um, or four dollars because like ninety five percent of my customers are american but um yeah now i'm gonna have to raise that by 25 cents because the it's 20 more yen to go to get stamps 
to mail to America from here. Yeah, so, yeah, we're finally seeing cost of goods rising outside of the grocery store, yeah. um, which is a bummer. So I guess some tax cuts would be nice, even though we can't vote as foreigners. <laughs> so Maybe that'll if, be voted in. Yeah, if we approve of him or not, we don't. It doesn't matter, um, mm. but it'd be nice if we had a little bit of extra money. Um, yeah, we'll see it'd what probably happens. be like, like half a percent or something. Like you'll make yeah. like eighty more yen. Yeah, but it's probably not a big deal anyway. I but. think it's funny. It's like often Japanese people get very excited about even like a tiny savings. Mm. They'll be like, "Oh, well, you should do this instead because you'll save a hundred yen." The points, cards, and coupons are like really popular. Even though, yeah. like, I got a point, I got a coupon booklet at the grocery store, and it's cool because you get this whole booklet. Like when you check out, they're like, "Oh, here's this month, this month's booklet," but then when you flip through and you're like, "Wow, look at all these coupons!" Then you realize like they are only used on certain days, mm -hmm. so you you have to go back to the grocery store like on Tuesday to make sure you can get a hundred yen off this like beef. Yeah. <laughs> so it's okay, but it's not that great but it must work because they keep yeah. they keep giving me booklets well it's like a different level of frugality that i think we were moderately frugal back home like when we went to the grocery store we didn't buy name brand products and we still don't really buy name brand anything um but like i just remember i had a coworker telling me like oh i should only ever go to the bank during hours because it actually if you use the atm after hours they double the fee it goes up to like 220 yen which is so silly cash. because the atm is a, just a machine so yeah I it's don't know open why there's... as long as like, <laughs> i don't get it <laughs> open hours um, yeah so if you go during business hours it's like 110 yen to withdraw cash and so he was telling me that like he never ever withdraws cash like outside of hours and which, which I is mean, fine in principle but all you're saving is 110 yen yeah, and so if but, I need cash, I'm not going to be like, oh, I need cash. I can't can't possibly get it now. And I know that, I guess that's part of the whole thing of like saving is that you do all these tiny little yeah. things and it really adds up. But it just sounds so little exhausting that you're always looking for a way to save like 20 yen or 50 yen here. And then maybe if you do this, you'll save 30 yen. And if you do this, you can save 100 yen. And it's like, I know it, it, it does add up. But sometimes it's just so exhausting because there's so many tiny little, and mm -hmm. then it's like, did you bring your points card and like, did you bring your coupon or did you forget to bring your yeah. other thing? Like maybe if we were better at it and we did all of those things, they would add up in a bigger way. But yeah, we're not but very then, good at it so far. <laughs> yeah, it was, sometimes it's funny because the savings get like distributed across mm -hmm. things. Like, well, now I have points on my T card for Family Mart, but I also have points on my debit card because my debit card accrues points and that yeah so mm. i don't know sometimes it's like i, I have all these points and <laughs> i have all these points they're all over the place um maybe we'll get organized maybe one day so tourism is coming back in japan i mean we talked about how it's been coming back yes yeah, is good news for japan yeah. we've had good news for cats bad news for prime minister kishida but good news for japan um yeah. And it is. Yeah, so this is a little... I don't understand this percentage because I was actually looking into it more. And I don't. I think the way they represented it is a little interesting. But Japan has finally reached 96% of pre-pandemic visitation, um, which I think is only for the month of September mm. is what that statistic is for. But they've surpassed pre-pandemic tourist spending by 17.7 percent oh so people and are that, spending more when they come maybe. yeah so less people have visited but each person is spending significantly more almost 20 percent more that per is trip pretty significant um and that statistic was for between july and september mm. so the tourists that visited over the summer season spent on average about 20 percent more hmm. per person that's also interesting though because I guess you could never really control for this, but like when we travel, different purposes of our trip means that we would spend a different amount of money. Uh, I don't know if I'm explaining that right, but like, for example, when we visited for our honeymoon, we were willing to spend more because we were like, oh, it's a once in a lifetime, like this is a celebration trip. So we'll go 
eat at fancier restaurants or stay in nicer hotels versus when we were planning to come back in 2020, we had to cancel because of the pandemic, but that budget was lower just because it was not our honeymoon. <laughs> yeah. It was just so like I don't know how you would control trip. for that, but I guess I'm just wondering like July to September, are there holidays in there that people were buying more gifts for? Or like maybe if they looked I don't between think you can, September you would just have to January. survey people and ask yeah. them like each individual person, but they just look at generic statistics. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think you could control for that. Yeah. And they do have, if you go, we can link to this, but Japan actually has a really great tourism website mm. and they like break down tons of statistics and it's really interesting to scroll through and look at and like browse their tourism statistics. Um, but well, one of the relatively interesting, we think it's interesting. I think it's interesting. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. It's just. It's not yeah. that thrilling, but it's just kind of fun to look at numbers. Yeah. But for example, um, they're, the top three countries are still China, South Korea, and Taiwan. And for Chinese tourism. tourists spent 282 billion yen, or 20% of the total. And they also have the greatest amount of people that mm-hmm. come. So. so that makes sense. And then Taiwan, or Taiwanese people, spent an average of 204 billion yen. And then it was followed by South Korea at 195 billion yen. But for example, I think that more South Koreans visit Japan than Taiwanese. Hmm. So they even spend though, less money. Yeah, but they spend less money. Hmm. And it's really interesting because China, of course, has taken like a huge hit in visitation because political reasons. Um, but South Korea really picked up the slack. Hmm. Like way more South Koreans visited in 2023 compared to any previous year. Hmm. And so that's they say that's like a good sign because the they are starting to be friendly again. Well, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, and per person, it's 210, almost 211,000 yen per person, which I don't know how much like per person during their visit, but I don't so, know how long their visit is. So I looked this up because uh, I went to that website and I found some more statistics okay. um <laughs> but it comes from 2019 so it looks like during the pandemic years they didn't really track this yeah. so a lot of this data is getting compared to 2019 mm. for of course like pre-pandemic for how things are going um so in 2019 before covid the average spending per foreigner in the sightseeing and leisure category was 155,281 yen mm. Um, but the average yen to USD rate back then was 109. So $1 only got you 109 yen. Where right now we're at $1 gets you 150 yen. Wow. Um, so back then per person was spending $1,400. Dollars. Interesting. So now like they're spending much more yen, but their currency is also probably worth more in yeah. yen. So it gets a little tricky with like conversion rates. Um, but then they also have a list of, I was curious too. I was like, well, that's how much per like each person is spending, but how long are they yeah. in the country? Um, so essentially less than like nine or about 90% of people stay in Japan for less than 13 days hmm. when they come visit. So I'm kind of surprised cause it's such a, it's such a far, way i mean i guess i'm not surprised because of vacation days but but if you think of a majority of the visitors are from china south korea and taiwan like it's something crazy it's like 70 percent of people that come to japan are from those three countries Mm. so they can just like pop over for a short trip but eight and a half percent of travelers stay for three days 53 percent of travelers stay for four to six days an additional 30 percent of travelers stay for seven to 13 days Hmm. and then it's a really big drop off because only five percent stay for like two weeks to less than three weeks and then only two percent stay for longer than three weeks yeah interesting so yeah most people only come to japan for less than two weeks when we were here for our honeymoon in 2019 we had a unique vacation set up where we worked a lot in the summer and so then we could take a lot of time off in the winter and combine it with our winter holiday 
weekdays. So we had three whole weeks, which felt like a really long time. But yeah, so yeah. we're part of the one percent. Yeah, apparently. Yeah, look at us. Because <laughs> we just came for a long time, so and it's the interesting. Two percent of something. Yeah, it was funny because looking at the breakdown of like our budget and how much we spent during that trip, at first it seemed like we spent way more mm-hmm. than the average. But then when you see how long people spend in Japan and then you think about, okay, well, some people that are spending this on average are only here for like mm-hmm. six days. We spent that over the course of like three weeks. Mm-hmm. So I, I think we are fairly frugal travelers. Kind of. so we try. <laughs> Sometimes. I think we are more willing to spend money on, like, one really nice dinner and then, like, eat at convenience stores a lot. Yeah, we don't need a nice dinner or a nice hotel every night. Right. We might have, like, maybe two nights over the course of three weeks will be, like, a really nice experience. And then the rest of the nights we're in business hotels Mm -hmm. and eating cheap dinners. and. But it is fun to, to travel and save money to do something luxurious. Like that. Yeah, I was most surprised by looking at that uh, statistic website that I didn't realize that this like huge influx of tourism in Japan is a relatively recent phenomenon. Like hmm. it's only the past decade. So in 2011, um, there were only six million two hundred eighteen thousand like foreigners that visited Japan. In 2019, that was 31,882,000. So whatever that is, math-wise, that's like a five times <laughs> Yeah, increase. that's pretty shocking. I wonder why that happened in the early 2000s, or the early 2010s. I don't know, but it was like 2011 was pretty standard. And then 2012, there was like a huge jump. Hmm. And then every year after 2012, it was like these huge It's like leaps. right after the really big earthquake. I feel like that would dissuade me from coming. Maybe yeah. they had really good... Um, publicity. I mean, they do have really good, like, public imagery, but maybe there was just really good marketing. Yeah, it is interesting that Japan has. And I know that like Kanazawa specifically got much busier and much more touristy after the Shinkansen was extended, which was 2014. And that makes a lot of sense. Like, why would you, why would you get on a six or eight hour train before you know? And now it's like a three hour train, so it makes a lot more sense. Yeah, but. I would be interested to hear from somebody who's like a foreigner who's lived in Tokyo or Osaka or somewhere that is pretty global, but I guess hadn't seen a lot of tourism. Like if you've lived there for a long time, I mean. Because it makes me think about like, it doesn't surprise me because I knew this was like a stereotype, but here in Uchinata, I've had kids point at me and they'll be like, oh, a foreigner. And... I thought that, like, I did think it's weird because I was like, well, it's like 2023. Like, have you not seen a foreigner well, also before? Also, on our street, I know it's kind of rural, but I see other white people on the yeah. street, like, walking around. Yeah. But then when I was looking at the statistics and it's like, well, really back to, like, 2011 or 2012, there weren't... There were significantly less, Yeah, there maybe. weren't that many foreigners coming to Japan where really it's only been, and I mean, I guess not counting the pandemic years it's probably only been like seven or eight years that Mm. they've had this like massive influx of foreigners. So I guess if we have anyone listening who's lived here for decades, I want to know if you've noticed or if you, if like what that's been like to kind of see that change or maybe you haven't noticed it. I don't know. Yeah. Cause I, I kind of just assumed that Japan had always had this level of tourism, you know, Mm. like I just thought, you know, since the 90s, probably there have been like this massive like wave of hmm. foreigners come because pe- when people talk about why did you assume like the 90s? Because I mean, that's when Japan's like economy was really hmm. like rocketing and taking off. And they were probably like building tons of new stuff and like yeah. doing a bunch of cool things. And I assumed that maybe like in the 2000s, it would increase because around the internet and you could hmm. travel would become maybe more accessible and less intimidating because that's you true. could like see google it pictures yeah. and things and i don't know pre-internet yeah. travel must have been just so interesting and well, different <laughs> yeah I, that's a very like one of my millennial almost gen x statement to say mm. but yeah i just i thought that or at least i thought that there had been a more casual like i didn't, I didn't realize that it was just really recently there was like this mm. massive increase i thought that yeah it always just kind of been like it is and so it's interesting because now it's about, it used to be almost double the amount of Japanese people went overseas compared to people that came to Japan. 
Mm. But since 2011 or 2012, it's been almost the opposite. More now foreigners twice as come many to foreigners. Japan. Yeah. Because you said that your teachers, or you, something with your school was telling you that there's less students interested in studying abroad. Less Japanese students are interested in like studying abroad in like the quote, just Western news article I read. Um, that Japan, the government really is trying to push students to go study abroad and mm -hmm. like get international experience because Japan's always talking about like, we need to become more international. Um, so they're trying to convince more students to study abroad and they're not doing a good job mm -hmm. because even, especially post pandemic now. So they said they compared it to the West, which sometimes I don't really know what they mean by right. the West. Um, but they said compared to the Western average of well over 50% of students are interested in tr like studying abroad, mm. only about 30% of Japanese students have any interest in studying abroad. Which seems pretty low until you told me about how Japanese universities and or Japanese schools and then specifically the hiring schedules, those are both really different than what they are in like what we're used to in the yeah. United States. So in the United States, you can graduate from college and then you just apply for a job whenever mm -hmm. you want. But in Japan, there's a hiring season mm -hmm. where you graduate from college and then there's like a month or two month period where you're expected to enter the, and this is for like the big companies. Mm -hmm. Like corporate type businesses. Yeah. Like that's when they're recruiting and you're expected to enter the workforce during that period and apparently for a lot of these companies if you miss it you yeah. take a gap year and you have to wait like they're not going to hire any time during the year which is like, crazy if a spot opens up they're not going to fill it i guess or maybe they just wouldn't hire or fire anybody during that time but yeah i don't know so that would be really stressful to be graduating and to be like i have to get a job in this period of time yeah or else you're just going to be like working at home mm -hmm. like maybe a part-time job and so you were saying and that if they study abroad and they miss that period and they come back to Japan and maybe they take that gap year, it looks worse. Like then companies will say, why did, why were you not Apparently. in the workforce? So they're trying also to create this view that like, oh, it's like good experience to go yeah. abroad. And so, and then also because Japan's on a different, which I think we need to look into this. I think there are more Asian countries that are on the same school year schedule as Japan but it's a completely different school year schedule from the West. Or from so, the U.S. Well, Europe and like countries mm. like that. So if they study abroad in a European university or an American university, it's a different like It's like block. a semester system. Yeah. Well, they do that here too. But you graduate in April mm. or you graduate in March and you start school year in April. So mm. it's just very different. And so that's like a huge hindrance to kids that want to study abroad and mm -hmm. i guess for whatever reason now more kids are like yeah i'm not interested yeah i mean that would be a lot of stress i can imagine yeah and i, I can didn't... say as the foreigner teaching like english at my high school mm -hmm. which i know my high school is a bit of an exception i haven't talked to like any kids that have any interest mm -hmm. in traveling abroad i'll always ask them and sometimes we'll do lessons revolving around like like how where would you like to go or what would you like yeah. to do and all the kids are like i don't want well, to go anywhere when i was in an american university studying abroad in europe was appealing and convenient it was like convenient yeah. because you could just pay a little bit more than what you were already paying for classes pay for a plane ticket and then you could get like kind of a vacation uh i mean you were studying but it was kind of a vacation experience on your studying time so it was convenient and appealing but if i was in a situation where i'd have to go somewhere that my credits wouldn't match or i would be thrown off my schedule it would be stressful it would impact my like future career like yeah and that, also with the yen now being so yeah weak. it's so weak yeah so that would be i didn't even think about that it's, you'd be traveling abroad and you'd be like losing so much yeah, money because the and dollars and abroad. euros and even pounds kind of right now are all pretty similar yeah the pound's still worth like a bit more pound is but. is greater but yeah the yen is much weaker comparatively so yeah. yeah all those things i don't blame them it's unfortunate but i wonder yeah. though if you ask them like if they're interested in travel like maybe they're not interested in study abroad well, that's what i asked my high school kids and none of them yeah one kid wants to go to china mm -hmm. and then other than that they were like why would i want to hmm. they're like i don't want to go anywhere that's interesting so i mean yeah totally fair but yeah i wonder like in a university setting if yeah. you ask like university kids oh are you interested in traveling abroad i yeah. wonder how they feel about 
travel. And, yeah, mm-hmm. I don't know. Well, do you have a word of the week? I do. Okay. What is it? Oh, you go first this time. Okay. Um, I've gone first the past few times. So. Oh. Well, mine is Isho. Oh. Uh-huh. Do you want to guess? No. I don't think you'll be able to guess. <laughs> it's not Isho with the little tsu, because that means like together. Hmm. But Isho is costume. You can also say oh. costume using katakana syllables, but Isho is, there's like a different kanji and yeah, it's how you say costume. And that's what I was thinking of because we're about to go to a Halloween party and we're going to borrow some costume clothes mm. and hopefully be very festive. Yeah. Halloween's not like a big thing here. We'll talk about that next week probably, but yeah, we're, we're going to volunteer at a, a little Halloween festival kind of games and candy and stuff at the local library with some some kids and some other foreigners can't wait (laughs) yeah what's your word so mine is and you'll tell me if we've done this before is doki 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 Mm -hmm. i think we we've done toki doki before yeah well this one's doki doki it's like when your heart is beating fast you're nervous yeah it can be like a lot of things like yeah it's it's supposed to be the onomatopoeia for like a heartbeat. Mm. Um, so a lot of people will do it when you're like, it was like a teenage thing. Like, Oh, like, are you going to ask her, like ask her out on a date? Mm. And then it's like the doki doki is mm. the like sound effect. My um, hairdresser used that one time when I, it was like the first time I went to get my hair cut by her. And when we finished, I was like, Oh, I love it. And she was like, Oh, and she used like the doki doki. Cause she said that she was like nervous oh, to yeah. cut my hair in case i didn't like it or something yeah and i was like no it's fine <laughs> i was just thinking about it because you when nervous? i was no when i was at that dinner they were trying to ask me what my max heart rate is oh but they couldn't think of the word for heart rate yeah. in english so they were like saying it in japanese and then one guy was like doki doki <laughs> and then they all thought it was so funny because <laughs> they were like he was trying like, to explain literally like, your heart heartbeat. yeah like yeah. heart beating but everyone thought it was funny because, yeah, you don't use it that way. Yeah. <laughs> but when he said that, I understood what he was saying. And I was like, oh, like, I get it. Yeah. But, yeah. That's very nice. Well, that that kind of brings us to the end this time. Yeah, so don't forget to take a guess at which of those eight candies yeah. are not popular the in Japan. The least popular candy. Yeah. Well, so don't bring this as your omiyage. Just out of your coworkers, but, yeah. That's a pretty good percentage, about 30 people. <laughs> percentage population of Japan. It's a small so, sample size. Yeah. But thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Yeah. We'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye. Bye.